the first city that was founded in modern Israel even before 1948, back in around 1917, was called Patak Tikva, the doorway to hope. Can you imagine founding a country and naming the first city in that country the doorway to hope? What a wonderful way to look at the world, huh? That's part of our inheritance, isn't it? We walk through the doorway of hope. Lord, where will we go? You, only you have the words of life. Today is uh, the 21st of November. We're right about 40 days to the end of the year. I think you all sense that 2014 is probably going to be a very significant year for a lot of reasons. Things are emerging, things are becoming manifest, which will probably be beyond our imagination at this point. Think about where we are today and remind yourselves as we go forward at this moment. I like to say that history passes you by while you're watching it. If you're not deliberately and intentionally engaged in, in observing the events around you, you can miss a lot of it. Just like you turn around and your kids are grown up. I want to talk a little bit about the mystery of evil and deception. As we can certainly agree that uh, the power of deception and betrayal is strong in the world that we live in, isn't it? It doesn't seem like anybody in our leadership even is capable of telling the truth anymore, doesn't it? Can't we all pretty well discern? We don't even need to know the details, do we? We just get a general sense something's not right. What happened to the love of the truth? What happened to honor and integrity? And I wanted to refer to 2 Thessalonians. It talks about the mystery of iniquity that already works in the world that we live in. Why is it called a mystery? Because it's mysterious. But are mysteries meant to be hidden from us? No. They're meant to be revealed to us. But they're not revealed to us if we approach it passively. Any more than we can sit in this room and wait for grapes to drop out of the sky into our mouth. Like baby birds. There is an, act, there is an involvement in discerning the times, right? That's part of our vocation as believers, to be actively engaged and looking around at what's going on around us. You can, you say red sky in morning, the day will be fair. How is it you can discern the signs of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times? I would suggest that that was a polite encouragement for us to be aware of uh, what's going on around us. He rebuked the Pharisees, but I think it was instruction for all of us. And one of the most evil things about evil is that it doesn't appear to be evil. And we're seeing it every day. We're, the evil that we're seeing is not hideous, deformed, ugly. It's quite attractive. I like to call it the John Gotti principle. If you see him in court when he was on trial for all the bad things that he did, it's almost psychologically impossible for you to believe that that man, in, that attractive looking man in that nice suit is a mur murderer. But he was. So, what we see around us is very subtle. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. We hear about the demonic power a lot and the ugliness of it, but what we also need to be simultaneously aware of is the paradox of the beauty of evil, if you will, the allure of it, the attractiveness of it, that magnetic thing that wants to draw us toward it, like moths to the flame. And there's a comp, oh, before I forget, I always offer to give the PowerPoints that I present to anybody that wants them. Just let me know and I'll get them to you somehow or another. That way you can go back over everything yourself because all the references and sources of information that I use are all down in the notes of the PowerPoint. So you can go back, dig into it even more, and do what I call gain mastery of the subject. 
It's kind of like watching somebody else eat. It doesn't do you a lot of good, does it? <laughs> Boy, that looks good. Wish I could have some. Well, you can. It should not be wondered at or considered a new or strange thing or thought incredible that there are such beings disguised as good angels that have their abode in the regions of light and appear to be possessed of divine spiritual light and understanding who appear to be clothed in array with light but are disguised in the form and essence of the Lord himself. That's Lucifer, son of the morning. The evil that we see around us is evil the greatest thing about it is that it doesn't appear to be evil. So how can you discern it? By filtering everything that you look at and evaluate and decide on through the lens of the Word of God. If it doesn't line up with the Word, that's it. You don't, you don't even consider it in part of, of your decision. We're going to talk about prophecy, or I should say prophetic perspective. And you should know, going in, most of you probably do know already from first-hand experience, when you walk into the prophetic world, you're walking into spiritual battle. Because you are automatically an adversary. By stating the truth, you're automatically an adversary that to the princes of this world, who if they understood it, would not not have crucified Jesus. Those same principalities and powers still operate today, and they are no less accepting of the truth than they were then. Is that the right grammar? No more accepting of the truth than they were then. And so they're going to react violently to it. So if we talk about macro-prophetic events that are happening on a global level that are in line with prophecy, in line with the Word of God, they're going to contradict virtually everything you see around you. I don't care how you get your information, through media, through internet, through however you get it. Majority of it is going to contradict what the Bible says. So there you are with the paradox, <coughs> the dilemma, the choice you have to make. What are you going to base your decisions on of how you respond to the world around you? Are you going to be like the ten, one, five of the ten virgins? You know, if when you first read that, it sounds like the five with the oil are selfish, doesn't it? Oh, we, haven't ha we don't have enough, we can't give you any. Well, it's not a problem that they were selfish. The fact is that they couldn't give it to them even if they wanted to, because you buy it by faith. There's no way in the last trump that you're going to be able to impart to anybody else a measure of faith. You have to gain it yourself. You have to become engaged in this thing we're involved with. And there are two things that most commonly I would suggest occur when you start talking about deep subjects like this. Fear and anger. Uh, you're afraid. There's a lot of reasons why people are afraid. Fear of loss is the main one. Fear of loss of property. Fear of loss of relationship. Fear of loss of your life. And there's also a response. Men in particular are angry a lot, but they don't realize that anger is really fear. When you see people raging, most of the time the fact is that they're really terrified. Men especially. Men who are angry are terrified. So these two are ugly cousins, fear and anger. But anger at whoever you might direct it to, leadership, the world, the bad guys, whatever. So I'm going to look at a couple verses because in reaction to this subject, this subject which will continue on, as we go forward, remember it says, enter not into temptation, deliver me from evil. 95% of overcoming temptation is the simple fact of recognizing that you're being tempted. A lot of times you don't even realize it. But when you come to that stunning realization, I'm being tempted by the subtlety of our adversary 
And once you do recognize it, wisdom brings down strong towers. You defeat it. And you very likely will, if not never be tempted by that again, you won't ever very likely be as strongly tempted by it once you recognize it. If you are involved in addiction, when you come to the point of realization in your life that there is life without it, that's a major victory right there. When you come to the realization, the Lord tells you, son or daughter, this is not my best for you. This is a substitute for what I have for you. The Holy Spirit and all of the ministry that I will provide for you is a pure life that you can live. Everything else you're seeking is a substitute for, for my best for you. And that grace right there can free you. So there's a few verses regarding fear. I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will help you. As I read that, I was thinking of, I just, the picture came to mind of the Lord of the Rings, right at the end of the movie, when Sam reaches over the cliff and holds on to his hand and says, don't let go. I will take care of your right hand. Do not fear, I will help you. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. I'm not trying to claim I have a mastery of that verse because no fear in love. It's hard to make an association between things that you fear and love. But it's, one of the, it's an example of what I was referring to earlier. That's what the word says. If that's not exactly how our mental, our processes if we don't recognize the connection between la lack of love and fear, then we can ask the Lord to help us understand what does that exactly mean? How do you connect the lack of fear to the lack of love? He that is slow to wrath, now we're going to talk about anger, is of great understanding, but he that is hasty of spirit exalts folly. That's just a a, a fancy way of saying if you get in a hurry you're going to make mistakes especially if you're mad people get in accidents because they're angry they, they speed up try to run through the red light and end up in a smash up be angry and sin not but let and let not the sun go down upon your wrath that's a good one too because trying to discern what exactly does that mean especially after you just had a big fight with your husband or wife, is really a good one, huh? You're laying there in the middle of the night. Well, yeah, the sun's definitely gone down upon my wrath, and I'm still mad. So how am I going to get myself out of this pickle? Wherefore, my beloved, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. Nothing you do in anger will endure. I don't care what it is, how noble it might seem, what great goals you might have. If you're doing out of a motivation of anger, it will not endure. Nothing, of, nothing that is righteous or eternal will come out of a spirit of anger, regardless of what it is, even if you are right. The worst fight my wife and I ever had was over being right. We just about destroyed each other over arguing about being right. How did the Lord handle, handle anger? There was a man in a, the Lord went into the synagogue and there was a man with a shriveled hand there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse him, so they watched him see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Now this is deliberate and intentional. You've got to keep in mind these are small towns. Holly Spring is a, is a big city compared to the villages that in these times. Everybody knew everybody. When Jesus went to the synagogue on, on the Sabbath day, they all knew him. It wasn't like he was a stranger. This is his hometown. So he, did, he walked right into this situation knowing full well what was going to happen. He said to the man with his shriveled hand, stand up in front of everybody. Now he's definitely got their attention, doesn't he? 
because they're all going to see what is he going to do. Then Jesus asked him, what is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or kill? But they remained silent, cowards that they were. He looked around them in anger, and I looked up the Greek word in his indignation. This is not some wimpy emotion that he was feeling. This is a f close to fury. And deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely re restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill him. See what I mean by cowards? They didn't have enough courage to stand up and be honest about how they felt, right or wrong, but they went behind his back. Here's the point of this whole passage, which is fantastic to me. When, I, when I, the Lord gave me this revelation sitting on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, I had asked for a long time to understand the distinction between the Son of God and the Son of Man. Because we hear both of those phrases a lot in the Bible. What does that actually mean? And this is the verse he used to show me. As a son of man, he was angry. As a son of God, he healed the man with the withered hand. At the same time. Now think about that. Can you reach out and minister to somebody while you are simultaneously going through an intense emotion like close to fury? That's the Son of God and the Son of Man at the same time. He was able to be angry but sin not and, and allow the Spirit of God to flow through him so powerfully that that man's withered hand was healed. Now that is the Son of God and the Son of Man at the same time, which is what we're called to be. Great challenge though, right? Now we're going to get to our subject, prophetic perspective. And what I'm going to try to do, I mean, this is all our subject, but a lot of times I've given similar talks and it always comes down to the same question. Well, what are we going to do? Holy smokes, is it really that bad? I'm paralyzed. I can't do anything. I'm either afraid or I'm mad or both, and I don't know what to do about it. So think about asking the Lord to give you wisdom. What about how to respond to what we're, gonna, what we're seeing coming our way? Because if you become angry, you become useless. You, you uh, what you call it, uh, neutralize yourself. You're out of the fight. You broke the rules, so to speak. Sit down, take a time out. Because you're not in a race. I mean, you're not disqualified, don't get me wrong. But you need to take a time out till you can figure this one out. Not on your own. He will help you. But if you're in, involved in ministry and, you, and you're... I told a colleague of, one, my, of, of mine one time, either you are going to master your anger or it's going to master you. And he didn't listen. And ma anger mastered him. If you succumb to anger, you will be, soon become the only emotion you're capable of feeling because it dominates all other emotions. If you don't believe me, just look in the world we live in. Virtually everything you see is, is, is motivated by ang anger. The entitlement mentality that's prevailing in our culture is motivated by anger. Anger that I'm not getting what I'm supposed to get and you're the one that's keeping me from getting it. The whole life becomes consumed by that and you cannot see anything except through the emotion of anger. Now, this is our subject, meaning this is what we're going to base it on tonight. This is the word of Hashem. That's the Jewish Bible translation of Yahweh. The Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog, of the land of Magog. Gog is a person or a personality, a leader. The land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, 
Behold, I am against thee, O God, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you about and put hit hooks in your jaws and bring you forth in all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed most gorgeously, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them handling swords, Persia, Cush, and Put. I put the Hebrew in here, Fars, Cush, and Put. Fars is like Farsi. Cush is the name for uh, the Horn of Africa, and Put is the old name for North Africa, particularly Libya. All of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all of his bands, the house of Togarma and the uttermost parts of the north. I wanted to emphasize that. This also uses the word Rosh. Rosh means a lot of things in Hebrew. Rosh means head, Rosh means up, and it also has to do with the cornerstone. You know, the cornerstone in an arch, that's called Rosh Pina, the top stone. And all of his bands, and even many people with you, Shiva and Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, with all the big shots thereof, shall say unto you, have you come to take the spoil? Now's the time. Game on. And this is the Gog Magog War. We hear a lot about from Ezekiel chapter 38. But what I'd like to try to do is uh, translate that into modern times. Is this just a bunch of stuff from way back when? Or is it real? So if it's real, what does it look like? And that's part of the deception of I was telling you about earlier. How come we don't see stuff like this on TV every night? Why, does, why is it we never hear anything even remotely related to anything like what we're going to see tonight? When this, after all, is the Word of God, the way and the truth and the life. This is the, this is the lead up to the big war that's going to break the nations and conclude in the Zechariah scenario where all the nations of the world come up and celebrate the Feast of pa Tabernacles. And if they don't, that the Lord will withhold rain from them. This is an old map from 1854. This is before any of the modern nations that are there now on the map, like Saudi Arabia and Iraq and Jordan and, Sa and Syria, even existed. Did you realize that these nations didn't exist till 1917, after the end of World War I, when the Ottoman Empire was broken because they joined ally with Germany? Fatal error on their part because they didn't discern the times. They lost the war and the British and the French primarily came into the Middle East and divided it up into the modern nations that we have now. But what, amazingly enough, one thing I wanted to point out is these three big names on this old map. That's Ham, there's Shem, and there's Japheth. It's a little hard. I know the light's not quite right. Those are the three sons of Noah. So one of the first things you're going to realize is that this cataclysmic war is fought by the descendants of Noah. Another amazing thing is if you read the description of the Garden of Eden, you find out that the Tigris and the Euphrates River is the eastern boundary, and that the river that flows through the land of Cush is the western boundary called Gihon. If any of you have been to Israel, you know the Gihon Spring. Some of you might have walked through it, the, little, the one that's about this high and about that wide. I walked through it with no light. I went like this. There's nobody around me. The kids that I was with took off and left me. So I was there inside this Hezekiah's tunnel in pitch black. Of course, I wasn't afraid because I know there's another end to it. But still, that was my first uh, venture through Hezekiah's tunnel was in the pitch black. With my hand up, pop my head like this so I wouldn't conk my head on a rock. That's called Gihon. It's taken from this river. It's the Nile River. Because it says it flows through the land of Cush. This is the land of Cush. And the other one is down here in the land of Havilah. 
the land of where there's gold. This is all, I think, 230 or 320, I forget which. In Genesis, it gives you the boundaries of the Garden of Eden. So it may seem like it's stating the obvious, but maybe not. This great cataclysmic war is fought in the Garden of Eden. And Israel is the eye of it. Israel is in the middle of the old territory of the Garden of Eden, all this area here. And the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth are fighting the war. And here are the territories. The first one is Libya. I know it's a little hard to see, but there it is. People before modern times knew where all these regions were. The next one is Cush. <coughs> there it is. It's also called Ethiopia. But it's not just modern Ethiopia. It's the whole Horn of Africa, including Sudan, which we're going to see tonight. Then the next one is Fars, Farsi, Persia. Then the next one is the Rosh, the north, the uttermost parts of the north. And look at it's what it's called. And then after that comes Magog, Togarma, and uh, Gomer. All the names of the, of the descendants of these... By the way, these are all descendants of the sons of Noah. They're names of tribes, people, ethnic groups. Of course, they don't call them that anymore, but they are all the descendants of them. And Tarshish, Ta Saul of Tarsus. That was a province of Cilicia in the Roman Empire, and it was like a modern, it was kind of like an Atlanta, or maybe a New Orleans, or maybe a Mobile. It was a port city. <coughs> and it was, it, it was the axis point of the Roman Empire, see? All the ships came here. It was a cosmopolitan town, so Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was a cosmopolitan person. He was very, very savvy of the things of this world. But he was also a whiz kid. And when he went to Jerusalem to become a rabbi, he was a genius. And he was a, a child prodigy. But he was very familiar with, with uh, the Roman Empire because where he lived was the axis of it. And then there's Sheba and Dedan. These are all the names of the people that we just read. And there they are on this map from 1854. Superimposed over that are the descendants of the sons of Noah, and superimposed over that is the boundaries of the Garden of Eden. And here's a more modern one. Same layout with the modern names of the countries, superimposed. All And what it is, what it, if you look at it from a strategic and tactical perspective, it's four macro powers, one to the north, one to the south, one to the west, and one to the east. And, but it's not just them, it's and all their horsemen with them. So when you talk about Persia, go east, Afghanistan. If you talk about Rosh and these, go a little bit over here and you have all the other Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, and all those countries, they're all pulled in like iron to a magnet into these four major power blocks. And then this down here, the whole Horn of Africa, Sudan, Ethiopia, Djibouti, modern day Somalia, they're all part of the same territory. And then Put, i.e. Libya, is the whole North Africa. Because it's, again, Tripoli, which we heard a lot about in the news, is a port city. So these are all tactical strong points. And then if you want to go really far, you, you, I didn't talk about it in this presentation, but uh, Europe, the EU, has made a formal alliance with what's called the Mediterranean Alliance. So that pulls all of Europe into this thing too. And all you really have to do is just read the press every day from Europe and you can see how anti-Israel they've become because they've allied with these guys. So, what do you do if you're living in a world where the, the principalities and the power, those are the invisible power. We have elected officials, but we also have non-elected forms of power. 
the principalities and powers that we hear about. So what the people that we elect are only a small part of the hierarchy of principalities and powers. And yes, it is our civic duty, but there's more to it than meets the eye. But what do you do if you live in a culture like that and it has become an antichrist, i.e. anti-Israel, i.e. And remember what was I talked about last time, the eternal covenant, remember? The eternal covenant that the Lord made with this place right here in the center of the Garden of Eden. By the way, did you know that underneath the land of Israel is vast reservoirs of water just waking, waiting for an earthquake to split the ground open and flood the whole Jordan River Valley with fresh water? So we're going to look at Libya first. It's all North Africa. And I don't want you to mischaracterize what I'm showing today as though I am focusing on one person. I'm not focusing on one person. I'm focusing on the times we live in and the, leader, the, uh, the principality and powers that are in place that, that are both visible i.e. elected and or invisible that are not accountable to the structures of our government and some it's not always easy to tell where one begins and the other leaves off but I think we're all noticing that there are some principalities and powers that are at work today that are beyond what we have ever seen in terms of what we're accustomed to with an elected form of government aren't isn't there so this is Gaddafi and President Obama shaking hands on July 9th in 2009 at a, at a meeting of, the, what does it say? He's a president of the African Union. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice became the most senior U.S. official to visit Libya in more than a half a century, but Obama is the first U.S. president to shake Gaddafi's hand. So, I guess he's just being polite, right? July 9th, he shook Gaddafi's hand. On March 19th, the war started. We were in it. And October 20th, 2011, Gaddafi was killed. How do you think the adversaries of the West viewed that event? I would suggest that they viewed it as a blatant betrayal. The man you shook hands with and, and gave assurances to in less than a year and a half or so, whatever my math is, was dead in a war that we helped. Now, if you wanted to uh, reset the narrative, what do you think you might do as a response? You might maybe attack an embassy and kill the people in the embassy. It wasn't over a video. It was, there's no video here. This is real life. But they base it on Quran 551. Don't take any help from the Ansar, which he did right there, because if you do, you'll become like them, and that is a that is a uh, apostasy worthy of death. So there's a lot of layers ideal uh, theologically in this picture. And the the Salafis, the jihadi guys, basically said that's what you get for forming an alliance. But they also simultaneously are saying there is no honor in a government that would shake his hand and provide him with assurances. Because remember, he was, he was uh, downgrading his military arsenal at this time. Within a very short time, the very same person that had government that had provided assurances to him was in a war against him. And not long after that, he was dead.
The Gaddafi regime launched a campaign of violence. So where are we now? March 13, 2013, Obama's new Lydia, Libya. And again, I'm not going to try to go through all of this, but the point is, we intervened in Libya. Libya is part of the Gog Magog alliance. We basically help set the table for the, on, the future war by helping that stronghold get toppled and power doesn't like a vacuum. So what has come in since then? This is now Al-Qaeda's headquarters. The Salafi have come in and set up power there and they will never be removed because it's biblical. Would they have done it without our involvement whatsoever? Yeah, they would have. And there is the spiritual paradox of all this. Well, there's nothing that we could do about it anyway, right? Well, think about the, net, the Babylonians. What did the Lord say about the Babylonians who destroyed Israel? I use you to judge my people, but you enjoyed it so much, I'm going to do it to you now. So the Lord uses nations to judge other nations. That doesn't mean that they themselves are immune from it. So this is just one little piece of the puzzle here. The next one is, these are just, I just queried, did some querying. There's all kinds of articles that you can read about that are related to what has happened in the aftermath of the war in Libya, but let's leave it to say that we have participated in setting up the table, the silverware and the plates and the glasses on the Gog Magog table. So we've got one down, right? And I'm going to throw in Mubarak as part of North Africa. This happened, this is uh, the comments from the administration at this, at, during this event. A lot of assurances. I want to say once again, I'm grateful for his visit, his willingness to work with us, helping advance the interests of peace and prosperity around the world, focusing on the Arab-Israeli situation. See, that pesky Arab-Israeli situation just keeps coming back, doesn't it? That burdensome stone. Well, August 18th is when this event happened. The Arab Spring happened, started January 25th. We supported the overthrow of Mubarak. And February 11th, 2011, he was overthrown. Again, we went from this to that in a very short period of time. <laughs> Don't let him shake your hand. <laughs> and the point of it is, you have to look at this from this perspective of of our adversary, both in terms of the macro one, Lucifer the deceiver, the Antichrist, the little horn, the king of the north, all the different terms that is used that's going to eventually lead to the great wars that are coming our way. And I remember in the 70s and 80s, we used to talk about the role of American prophecy. And some of us have been believers, right? Wasn't that a big question on the table back then? Well, I think we can see part of the answer now. Now the next one is Kush. That's the Horn of Africa. Now we're just going to go through the same kind of thing. I always put everything in chronological order because I have a saying, let the picture draw itself. If you arrange things in pretty much chronological order, you will see how events unfold over time. So here is, a, here is uh, the Obama's administration of engagement. They call it engagement and dialogue. That's the term for it. In America, we call it countering violent extremism overseas or foreign policy uh, since it's called engagement in dialogue. We're engaged in dialoguing with the Islamic National Congress Party of Sudan. Wait, where is Sudan? Is Kush. So, meanwhile, 
It talks about the Sudan shuffle. Now we're going from December of 09, fast forward up to June of 2012. And we have a Obama administration opposes a congressional measure that would end U.S. foreign assistance to any country that pays host to the genocidal Sudanese President Omar al-Bashir, and so on and so on, on down. They're opposed to it. There are people in our government, whether they're, whether, I don't, I'm not trying to, I don't know what their, their theological or ideological orientation is, if they're believers or not, but there are people who recognize that this is not a good policy and tried to stop it, but were overruled. Religious freedom advocate f flees Sudan. This was yesterday. So you start with a little seed that gets to become a plant, and pretty soon you've got a six-foot tall weed growing in the middle of your garden. Christian lawyer helping to promote religious freedom in Sudan has fled the country after authorities threatened to kill him if he failed to report to them every single day. Sudan is going to draft a new constitution and it's going to be based on Sharia law. Sorry about that, that's my phone. <laughs> so the point is, is by enabling or however you want to put it, not standing ground, you allow evil to flourish. And now we've come to a point where it's pretty much, you can't turn it back. Now we're going to talk about Fars, Persia and Iran. And here is Iran's Rouhani may meet Obama at UN after American president reaches out. He was promoted as a moderate. Why? He just suddenly was promoted in all the media as a moderate. He was in charge of the nuclear program for Iran before he became president. And another interesting thing is, here's a picture of Roche, the North, and Iran together. You want to see how prophecy is incrementally fulfilled in modern times. There are two of the four major axes right there. And this stuff, it's hard to keep them all, all the threads separated. This is really like one snarled up big giant ball of string. But just think about it as four different colored threads that are snarled up in that ball of string. Just work your way through, follow each one at a, t at a time, and you'll be able to, you know, discern enough of it to make sense of it. The Russians formed an alliance with the Organization of Islamic Conference back in 2008 and told them in, in um, Dakar, Senegal, that from now on, our agenda will be your agenda, and our programs will be your programs. And one thing about Putin, he does exactly what he says. So here's a picture of them together. He's being promoted uh, prior to his visit to the UN as a moderate, but he's anything but a moderate. Now, historic phone call between Obama and Rouhani caps Iran's big week at the UN. September 28, 2013. So a week later, no, what? Uh, two weeks later? After he begins to emerge on the picture, the press is, is focusing on the historic phone call between the two. And now, what about Iran in the meantime? You guys have been watching the Geneva talks. I don't know if you have or not. But right in the middle of the Geneva talks, which are going on right now, yesterday, right? No, wait, this is today. The whole country of Iran mobilizes a massive war drill called Towards Jerusalem. Iranian military forces launched a series of massive military drills across nine provinces following an order by Supreme Leader Khomeini, according to state media reports. It will continue through today and the rest of the year. These guys, the Bashar forces, this is the real bad guys. 
A lieutenant commander of one of the volunteer fighting battalions said the drills were meant to show of Iran's ability to confront enemies at key points across the country, and so on. So where's the disconnect? We're reaching out to this country who, ha who is totally open about their intentions. And we keep calling them a moderate. See, somebody's not filtering their world through th worldview through the Bible, are they? So what is their worldview? It's Psalm 2. Why do the goyim rage and the people imagine the vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, parenthetically, and the land of the covenant saying, let us cast their cords away from us. Now, I'm going to throw in Afghanistan because, as I mentioned earlier, it's closely allied with Iran. Iran is helping them on the West, supplying them IEDs and a lot of different weapons. And we're about to close the chapter on Iran. So here's, here's back in January. They're, they're talking about what's going to happen in the future between our government and Karzai and fast forward to June the Afghan war is coming to an end and so on you guys can go back through and read all this how do you think the rest how do you think our adversaries again you always have to ask if you're involved like me with strategy and tactics you always have to ask the question how do they see it from the other side they see this as a massive surrender and if they feel like, if they, if they realize that we're not committed to stand up for what we really believe in, that's going to empower them theologically. Allah is on our side. The wind is in our sails. Time to go forward. That's why they said, forward Jerusalem, toward Jerusalem. This stuff is all interactive. As part of the ceremony, the new policemen were given weapons that they would be used for training. And as soon as one of the recruits received his, he turned it on the American soldiers who trained them and murdered them. That's sort of a parable for the way our whole relationship with that part of the world. Obama to apologize to the Afghans in exchange for a security deal. This is, what, two days ago? Now in Taliban, Afghans, let's see here. U.S. and Afghan officials reportedly have reached a tentative agreement on a critical security pact, which would include President Obama writing a letter to the Afghan people acknowledging mistakes during, made during the war on terror. Mm -hmm. How do you think it feels a guy with no legs or no arms when he reads that? What the heck did I do this for? Now that's a challenge to your integrity, and it might also be, tempt you to become angry, wouldn't it? So if that's you and you're a believer, how are you going to deal with that? You better have some good friends. And you better be, have a good relationship with the paraclete, meaning the Holy Spirit, the paraclete who stands beside you and walks with you and never leaves you or forsake you. Because if you don't understand it at this point in time, God help you. What about the rest of the country who's supporting the vets when they read this? They may also be tempted to become angry, mightn't they? But see, we don't have that option. It's not one of the tools in our kit. We're not allowed to do that. We have to stand, having done all, with total sobriety, taking our wisdom and instruction from the Holy Spirit. This is the time, my son or my daughter, that you live in now. The days are evil. You need to discern them. And then ask me how to respond in the correct way, like my son did when he healed the man with the withered arm. See how serious this stuff is? Because it's, I told you, you're going to be tempted to be angry. 
But, and we can't stop the process, can we? And there again is the paradox. How do you live in a time when we see these things unfolding, recognizing that they're bound to happen, but yet we're simultaneously involved, we live in a country that's directly involved with it. That is a paradox. Now, by the way, this whole thing I, uh, the, about the apology, I told you about the Quran. This is what it's talking about from the Quran. It has to do with this verse here, Quran 2191, with fitna. Fitna means stop. It means interference or to stop the advance of Islam. And so what we were doing basically in Afghanistan from a Quranic perspective was stopping the progression of Islam by just our mere presence and involvement there. So it says to kill them wherever you overtake them and expel them from wherever they have expelled you. What are they doing to us now? Expelling us. For the oppression, that means fitna, is worse than the killing. <coughs> you probably could read over that ten times and not realize what it's really saying. What it's saying is our interference with them is worse than them killing us. It's a moral inversion. We were there to do them good. From their perspective, we were harming them. We were causing them fitna. They were therefore certified by the Quran to kill us. Do not fight them that the Al-Masjid Al-Haram until they fight you there. Once they do, then game on. But if they fight you, then kill them. Such is the recompense of the disbelievers. And that word right there, disbeliever, is called kufarin which is a very nasty word in Arabic. The worst cuss words you know don't achieve the emotional impact that that word does in Arabic. And the phrase right there, wal fitna to the oppression. So from their perspective, they're getting us to admit that we cause them fitna. This is a huge theological victory for them. Meshach, Tubal, Gomer, and Togarma, I squished them all together because this is the most complicated of the whole snarl ball of string. You've got five or six different ones all crammed into a pretty small area of the world. The Caucasian mountains, Russia into the north, Turkey, Syria. Gee, where do we... There's something going on in Syria right now, isn't there? Here's a picture of Obama and Erdogan demanding that Assad step down? Why not? Erdogan is, is not a supporter of, of the uh, Alawite party. If he can get somebody to help him overthrow them, then all the better. But that doesn't mean, as you're going to see in a minute, that they're going to come to our side. So there is the May 17, 2013. Remember now, don't forget, this is the Gog Magog scenario. We're going right around in a circle. Now we've come up to the top. Turkish PM Erdogan hosts increasingly isolated Hamas leader Mashal in Ankara. I don't know why I have that, but it's October 8th, 2013. Everything I'm showing you is only a day or two or a week or two old, month maybe. It's not stuff that happened a long time ago. It's ha stuff that's happening right now. Increasingly isolated since the loss of a key ally in Mohamed Morsi. Wait a minute, I'm confused now. I thought Mohamed Morsi was a moderate that we're supporting in Egypt. But he's an ally of Hamas. So what's Hamas do? They go to the Turkish leader. Turkish guys just say, come in, my brother, come on over here, we'll take care of you. One, official, one Israeli official said Hamas was experiencing a period of unprecedented isolation because of its terrorism and extremism. So we've got an ally who's hosting our enemy. Of course, you know what Hamas stands for. It's, it's the, the Al-Ikhwan al-Muslimina, the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Palestine. They are the Muslim Brotherhood. But we're calling the Muslim Brotherhood moderates. As the European Union cancels parliamentary visit to Ankara, Androgen hosts Hamas 
Mashal and Hanea, both of them. These are the two top guys. Now, meanwhile, we asked uh, Israel to apologize to Turkey for the Mavara event, the boat where the, remember the videos of the Israeli soldiers rappelling down and, and getting practically beat to death? So, so we've convinced them to apologize to, to Turkey, essentially the same thing that we did with the peace accord that we have with Afghanistan, we made Israel do it to Turkey. And what did they respond to? It's too late. It's not good enough. Is there any grace of God there? Do you feel the Spirit of God working through this? Not really. I don't see any grace or forgiveness at all. They apologized too late after the Navy commando stormed a Turkish ship which was on its way to deliver humanitarian aid to the Palestinian enclave of Gaza in May 210, and so on. Hamas political leader pays surprise visit to Turkish Prime Minister Edrosian. This is another one. This is October, what was that, two months ago? Wait a minute, not even one month ago. And then Turkey shopped Mossad spies to Iran, a story leaked by Washington, to caution Netanyahu. Yeah. Wait a minute. Now I'm really getting confused. We're telling Mossad, no, we're telling the Turkish intelligence who the Mossad officers are in the Middle East, mm -hmm. and they're telling the Iranians. Is that how you treat your friends? And what kind of theological influence implications does that have? If you touch them, you touch the apple of my eye. Mm -hmm. We're messing around with stuff here that is so spectacularly, what's the word? Not dangerous. What is the word? Stupid. <laughs> Cataclysmic. Cataclysmic. We're messing around with, this is like Indiana Jones in the, in the Lost Ark. Raiders of the Lost Ark, when those German guys messed around with the, with the Ark of the Covenant. They didn't, that didn't turn out too well, did it? See, again, what is the worldview of powers that do this? This is Antichrist. This is anti-covenant. This is opposing the, the, covenant, the everlasting covenant blatantly, directly, without apology, not even in the shadows. This is right out in the open now. And a variation of this theme is happening in each one of the four macro power areas. And this thing is going to swirl around like a kaleidoscope until a point comes when it achieves critical mass, just like Iran seeking for the bomb. A point will come when they're going to achieve critical mass too. Of course, we know the Zachariah scenarios that sound very similar to what we think of as a nuclear bomb. I don't, I'm not saying pro or con, whether or what we call a conventional nuclear tactical weapon or what it is exactly, but it's also devastating, isn't it? Anyway, there's some more details. They're trying to pressure Netanyahu to drop his lone voice against getting Iran to abandon their nuclear program. Wait a minute, I thought we said we were, this was a red line in the sand. We were not going to let them get, become nuclear. Now all of a sudden, we're telling Netanyahu to shut up because we've made a deal with Iran in the last few days and you're, you're causing problems to the program. Instead, he must look toward and start getting used to the new Middle East and the role that Barack Obama has assigned for Iran. If he persists in this defiant attitude, Israeli intelligence may face more debacles than like the Turkish betrayal. This is deep stuff. They're blackmailing them. We're going to kill your officers and people on the ground if you don't shut up. And by the way, the Americans are the one who gave us the list. So if you don't like it, talk to them. 
and I'll, I won't read all this stuff here. Who benefits from the convergence of Iran and Turkey? Now here we go again, just like the one I showed you with Rosh, Russia. Now we're looking at Gog, I mean uh, Meshach and Tubal allying with Iran. And then here's another one, Hamas leader meets with Erdrosian in surprise visit. This is just another one. The easing of economic sanctions against Iran may give Turkey an opportunity to cooperate with Iran. Fact is, Ankara is seeking to find a way to Tehran. This is revealed by the scandal of Turkish intelligence agents revealing the names of Iranians who were working for Mossad, as well as by a visit of the leader at Hamas to Ankara. This is all going on at the same time. They're telling Hamas, come over here, boys. We're going to tell you all the names of your, of your Mossad officers. Go get them. Turkey continues to be active in the attempt to achieve reconciliation between all Palestinian parties. They're going to pay, play a major role. This is why the Lord is angry at Gog. Because you said, we're going to come and take a spoil against unwalled cities with all of our friends, Shishan and Data and all of them. This is what you're seeing right here. We're going to support the Palestinian parties in the overthrow of Israel. Khalid Mashal, chairman of Hamas, visited Ankara in October 2013 and was also attended by, see this is, uh, what am I saying, uh, kings, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together and the head of Turkish intelligence. What a coup. This is right when our administration is shaking hands with the same leader, telling what, how wonderful it is that we're cooperating together. Here's a story of when the Israelis, did you hear about Latakia, the, uh, the missile defense system that was bombed by the Israelis on October 29th? Well, we also told the Turks that it was the Israelis that did it. During the last three years, Turkey has severed virtually all military contact with Israel and led a boycott of all NATO cooperation. Led a boycott. The sources said Androsian continues to employ the boycott despite Israel's agreement to apologize and compensate the families of the eight Turks killed in a clash with Turkish-sponsored flotilla that sought to reach the Gaza Strip. So after they apologized and paid them millions of dollars, they said, screw you. It was too late. We're not taking it. And not only that, we're given the names of the Hamas, I mean your, your uh, Mossad officers, which the Americans gave us, to the Iranians and to Hamas. Now you can see why the Lord is angry with Gog. Because we'll just call Gog a spirit for lack of a better term. Turkey launching pad for Syria-bound Al-Qaeda jihadists. They said that, another one of the articles I had, that the, let's see, hundreds of Al-Qaeda recruits are being kept in safe half houses in southern Turkey, even before, before being smuggled over the border to wage jihad in Syria. So everywhere you look, you see this thing emerging, all in real time. And of course, we're supporting those guys. The foreign jihadists are now largely eclipsed the moderate wing of the rebel free Syrian army. Those are the ones that we're supporting. These guys are using the Turkish territory to, uh, as it just said, to, to uh, get poised to go into the Syrian, Syrian civil war. They have backed these rebels from the beginning, and this government has been assumed to share the West concerns about Al-Qaeda, assume. Again, it's a tangled ball of string. Not everything is clearly discernible, but it's obvious, I think, to everybody here, something very bad is going on. Or I could rephrase that, something completely prophetic is going on. Turkey's Androsian is quietly wooing America's enemies. This is just a couple weeks ago. 
He remains on, intent on unseating Basara Shad. He's suprom, strongly supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, opposes the Egyptian ruler Al Sisi. They're supporting of Hamas. They've cooled off with Saudi Arabia because they're looking toward Iran, which is the mortal enemy. And that's one of the questions I still have in this end time scenario. How is it they're going to find common ground when they don't get along very well with each other right now, when there's one thing they have in common, their hatred of Israel? Obama and the emerging Turkish dictatorship. The White House press release stated that the president and prime minister expressed concern about the situation in Egypt and shared commitment to support a democratic, inclusive way forward. What that means in English is we're both supporting the Muslim Brotherhood. That's the reason why they cut off aid to Egypt. You realize that? Because they imprisoned all the leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood because they deemed them a terrorist organization. We're telling literally the Egyptian government, let them out of jail, be inclusive, bring them back into the government. Otherwise, we're going to cut off aid. And they did it. So here's just some more highlights of a search you could do. He, now we're going to talk real quick about Russia because that's part of Roche. Remember the famous open mic event that happened back in March yeah. in the lead up to the election? After my election, I have more flexibility. He explained to President Medvedev to the rest of the world on Monday. He told them that he needed space to concentrate on his election before negotiating the Russians about a missile defense shield that might protect Eastern Europe from a neighboring predator. Well, you know what he did? He ended it. Yeah. And Obama and Putin hold talks with on Syria and Russia. And then here's one, Russia's rising. Guess who Russia's going to now? Egypt. Since we cut off aid to Egypt, Russia's got a $2 billion contract now with the new, the uh, interim government in Egypt. Putin closes up to Cairo as U.S. cools. This is a, this is like the 50s all over again when the Russians were supporting Egypt and Nasser. And we had the 56 war, the 70, 67 war, and the 73 war. And another thing that some of you may or may not know is that Russia's forming an alliance with all the stands. That's what it's going to look like. It's called the Russian Alliance. So you're talking about Gog, Magog, and Rosh, and all these combined ethnic groups from Ezekiel, and there it is right there. And that's what I was telling, to, telling you earlier about they have these macro power centers have alliances too, and there's a good illustration of it. This is all happening all in real time. Sheba and Dedan, that's the Arabian Peninsula. They, uh, they have severed diplomatic ties with the U.S. over their response to the conflict in Syria. They expected us to provide more support, and then we backed off. Remember the famous or infamous red line? And what did he do instead? He turned and made overtures to Iran. He circumvented the whole Syrian conflict and went right directly to Iran and basically made deals behind the closed doors, which he's trying to force the world community to honor on his behalf now. Otherwise, he's going to be even further discredited. Of course, the Iranians will have a reason to come after us even more if we don't honor those agreements. Now, Saudi is going to try to buy nuclear weapons from Pakistan because they're worried about Iran. What about America and Israel in all this? Well, I was that's supposed to be a, you know, a PowerPoint thing, but in September of 2013, the U.S. cut off aid to the current interim government of Egypt because they outlawed the MB entirely and have imprisoned all the top leaders for incitement to violence. The trials will begin in January 2014. See up here? Who's urging him to restore the Muslim Brotherhood? That would be like, I don't know, Russia coming to the UN and standing up and making a speech and telling the US government to let all the mafia people out of jail and bring them into the government, let them participate in the democratic process. 
That's how audacious this is. That we're telling the Egyptian government, who know full well who these people really are, that they have to let them out of jail and bring them back into the government, otherwise we're going to cut off foreign aid. And we did it. So that creates an opening, and in comes Putin. It's just another string in the net. Now here's just some of the recent negotiations. The Palestinians are now demanding that no more than 1.9% of the West Bank, which is less than half of the 4% of the land necessary to incorporate most of the settlers, as per details leaked out by a disgruntled Palestinian official. In other words, he was fed up because they keep changing the terms. And what that means is all the settlements in the West Bank, so-called settlements, will, will be cut. They, they won't be able to survive. There's not enough. They're asking for 4% total land of the West Bank to maintain the borders of the settlements that already exist. And the Palestinians are saying, no, we're not going to do it. And then there's just some more narrative about what's been happening in the Middle East lately. Since we're getting late, I'm not going to go on in detail. And Israel's stance and talks harshest in 20 years, says the PLO. The PLO is blaming the Israelis for the problem. They want security first. Imagine that. That the borders of the state of Palestine should be set out according to Israeli security needs that never end and will undermine the possibility of establishing a sovereign Palestinian state. You're talking the difference between 1.9 and 4% of the land. Any questions? <laughs> so we covered the, the whole region there in Ezekiel. Maybe another time we can talk about Psalm 83. This is the big macro powers that we talked about today. Psalm 83, if you look carefully through it, you'll see it's every single country that literally touches the borders of Israel today. And then look at Obadiah. If you look at Obadiah, it talks about the Edomites, the descendants of Esau. And you get the scenario, if you read through it and think about it, it's a face-to-face. -face. It's the intimacy of the Nazi concentration camps. You, you, and you to the chamber. Because they talk the same language. They were mercenaries. If you read Maccabees, First and Second Maccabees, you know, we heard, I, I heard at least, that the period between Malachi and the New Testament was the quiet time. It's not true. It was, it was a spectacular point in history of battles led by the Maccabees against the Seleucid Greeks. And the Seleucid Greeks had allies, mercenaries, that fought with them, including the Edomites, who were like the Native American guides in the cowboy movies that lead the cal cavalry to the other tribes, they spoke the same language and lived in the same land. So they would re lead the Seleucid armies to the strategic strongholds in Israel and they fought wars over it. The Edomites are the ones that built Petra. And if you read out Obadiah, you see this face to face. They present them, they prevent them from crossing the river, from escaping. They block them and tell them in their own language, go back. So that's kind of the thing. There's Ezekiel, then there's Psalm 83, then there's Obadiah. And it's just like a target. It grows out from there. If you put all three of those together and study through them, get all the names, study all the names and all three of those passages, you'll see it's all there. So what is, what's going on, guys? In all honesty, did you realize that there was this much action, we'll call it political action for lack of a better term, vis-a-vis -vis every single one of the four macro powers in the Ezekiel scenario? Did you realize it? So do you think maybe it's important to discern the times? Yes. And filter what we see and hear through, this, through the lens of the Bible? Otherwise, we're doomed, aren't we? We're, we're cooked. Because if you don't stay up with this stuff, how, it's going to come upon you unawares, in a sense. And then everybody's going to be asking, how in the world did this happen? What did we do wrong? 
And you have to look at it from the perspective of the eternal covenant. Are all these actions that we looked at today in even a small, even a little bit, supporting the eternal covenant? I would say no. no. Not by any means whatsoever. And what's going to happen with people like us who have the courage to stand up and say, no, that's not right. What do you think is going to happen? Something's going to happen. So uh, I appreciate you listening. I know it's a lot to take in. And again, if you want the PowerPoint, just let me know. And I'll give it to you. And I hope to come back again. Maybe we'll talk about some more prophetic pers uh, perspective or another subject. So thank you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you very much.